Welcome to the United States Army Operational Test Command's 28th Annual Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. It is a long-standing tradition within the Operational Test Command to induct a distinguished member of the Army Operational Testing Community into the Operational Test Command Hall of Fame. During today's ceremony, we will recognize Ms. Myra Baugh as the 43rd inductee into the Operational Testers Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, the host for today's ceremony is Brigadier General David Gardner, Commander of the United States Army Operational Test Command. The official party for today's ceremony consists of Brigadier General David Gardner and Command Sergeant Major Martin Conroy. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the invocation by Chaplain Lim of the 504th Expeditionary Military Intelligence Brigade and remain standing for honors to the nation. Join me with a prayer if you wish. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the induction of Ms. Myra L. Ball, as she is 43rd member to be inducted into the U.S. Army Operational Test Command Hall of Fame. Thank you for her selfless service and dedication to the Army. Bless Ms. Ball, her family, and Operational Test Command in America. Thank you and amen. amen. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The Operational Testers Hall of Fame was officially opened on this command's 25th anniversary, the 4th of October, 1994, and it's the only Hall of Fame that honors distinguished members of the U.S. Army's operational test community. This Hall of Fame is representative of the long and proud history of the military and civilians who have been prominent in the conduct of military tests and experimentation since 1856. From that very first Army operational test of the Camel Corps at Camp Verde, Texas, to the equipment our soldiers are using to this day, it has been and will be independent operational testers and their leaders that are out front forging the way. The Hall of Fame provides an opportunity to record the history of operational testing through the outstanding deeds of its people. Hall of Fame inductees represent a cross-section of field testers, leaders, analysts, instrumenters, and thousands of others who have significantly contributed to the search of truth through independent operational testing. Previous inductees include Major General John Norton, the father of Project Master, and Mr. Walter Hollis, former Deputy Undersecretary of the Army, Operations Research, a 50-plus year veteran of government service. Ladies and gentlemen, the Commander of the United States Army Operational Test Command, Brigadier General David Gardner. All right, good morning. How is everybody doing today? Pretty well. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, friends and family of the Operational Test Command, welcome to the 28th Annual Operational Testers Hall of Fame Ceremony. Thank you all for joining us today as we recognize an exemplary member of our OTC family and induct the 43rd member of our Hall of Fame, a tradition, as was described, we've carried on since October 4th, 1994. We honor these select individuals for their devotion to duty and commitment to putting the best equipment and technology into the hands of our soldiers as quickly as possible, while always ensuring we fulfill our sacred responsibility to provide truth in testing. 
Before we induct our newest member, I'd like to recognize the Hall of Fame, Fame members who joined us today, and I would ask that they stand uh, when I identify them. Uh, Mr. Waylon Smith, inducted in 2010, the Director of Methodology and Analysis, as I said last night, my favorite acronym, MAD. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Smith spent 38 years improving the methods we use to record and analyze operational tests. He created the formalized training programs for test officers and standardized operational testing procedures and techniques. Ms. Gail Scholl, she is inducted in 2017, Director of Test Technology Directorate. She served as an early leader and innovator in the areas of information technology and test technology shaping the evolution of the art and science of operational testing. And then Mr. Bill Fessler, there, here you are, inducted in 2019, director of the G4. Mr. Fessler resourced cutting edge instrumentation solutions that provided greater data reliability for test officers. We could use that today, by the way, so <laughs> talk to Rich and, and Fred Snyder before you leave. As the director of G4, he led the OTC in the creation of digitally connected laboratory uh, for technology development, test planning, engineering support, and certification of instrumentation, modeling, and simulation support. And then Dr. Rich Koss, inducted last year in 2020, the director of the Test Technology Directorate. He provided early contributions to the introduction of design of experiments for test and evaluation. He continuously led DOE implementation and operational testing, improving the validity of operational tests. And please join me in, in a round of applause for these special guests. Thank you for honoring us today by attending uh, for, for Myra. Operational Test Command has gone through a few name changes, but one thing has remained constant over the past 50 plus years of our existence. The extraordinary dedication, contributions, and selfless service of our military and civilian operational testers. The Hall of Fame recognizes the best of those operational testers. Operational testing is not exactly a simple process as seen Last night, when we uh, Meyer showed us the flowchart that uh, you're leaving behind, I hope, uh, for everybody to look at. But it is an extremely important piece of the Army acquisition process, and in fact, as you all know, required by law. Operational testers are responsible for designing and executing tests that are operationally realistic, ensuring the soldiers of the test unit use the system or equipment in an environment that closely represents their missions in combat conditions. Our 43rd Hall of Fame inductee, Ms. Myra Baugh, fully understood that sacred responsibility to the American soldier. Myra served the United States of America for around 30 years. I'm not going to give a specific uh, on that. <laughs> but she focused really her entire career here in the Army's testing and development community and made a huge, huge impact, which is why we recognize her today. Today we welcome three members of her family, accompanying her, her daughter, Medina, her brother, Tom, and his wife, Sharon, as well as a number of friends and family and loved ones from across the country. Thank you for, for joining us today, and we're so thankful that you joined us for this momentum occasion, honoring Myra as a selfless servant of our nation. Trailblazer is the word that, that I thought of last night as, as we were having dinner and as I read through uh, Myra's biography in the last uh, few weeks here. Dedicated and innovative, she focused her early career on creating foundational budget and resourcing processes for operational testing. Explicitly in 1992, she led a total ma a quality management team that systematically flow charted, and that's the flow chart that, that we still have today, that uh, systematically flow charted the test planning and execution process in extensive detail. Her team's recommendations were accepted and executed by OTC leadership, and this became the foundation for the current operational test budgeting process. She later transitioned into operational testing, and not only as one of the first women operational testers, but as one of the first civilians who did not have military experience, again, trailblazer. Ms. Baugh deployed a 130-member <coughs> test team in 1996 to execute the Focus Dispatch Advanced Warfighting Experiment, or AWE. This AWE included an Armored Battalion Live Force trials in Western Kentucky, linked in real time to constructive and virtual simulations at Fort Knox's mounted warfare testbed. She continued this pattern of excellence and led the team that executed user juries, gathered invaluable data used to create groundbreaking displays in the Force Battle Command Brigade and Below communications platform. This platform, known commonly as FBCB2, 
is the foundation of Army digital communications, offering leaders a seamless flow of information that enables command and control. The vision and leadership she provided her team helped bring about one of the most important aspects of this system, the VMF messaging software, function of the software. This intuitive communication system offers the ability to compose and transmit a set of 51 joint approved messages, increasing the speed, accuracy, and clarity of communications between units. In your programs and on a plaque we'll soon place in the Hall of Fame, you will find a more comprehensive list of Myra's achievements, highlighting her expertise and the gravity of her contributions to operational testing. Although there's so much more that could be said about her accomplishments at OTC, I want to just talk a little bit more about Myra. She began her service as a GS-4 secretary at the Bad Kreuznach German American Military Elementary School, helping shape the minds of children of American soldiers stationed in Germany. Her early experience in this position shaped her leadership philosophy and values later to come. When asked to describe Myra, those who had the pleasure to work with her emphasized a couple of significant traits. One colleague described her as an expert with a can-do attitude that inspired and motivated others beyond what they thought capable. Others mentioned her creativity and attention to detail, two qualities that made her capable of solving any and every problem presented to her. Another friend smiled when, recount, when recounting her renowned sense of humor. All the traits above were mentioned often, but the value that each and every person highlighted without fail was her integrity. She threw herself at the most difficult problems the organization had and solved them with both efficiency and ethics in mind. Myra ensured that she and others maintained the highest standard of work while executing tests and worked tirelessly to provide the American soldier the best equipment. An example of Ms. Baugh's value and leadership was how she empowered members of her FBCB2 team to benefit FBCB2 systems development. She would often receive 30 to 50 emails daily related to FBCB2. And after some thought, I'm told she chose to have her communication sent to her lead office automation clerk, a Mrs. Madeline Wright, and made her responsible for sorting and preparing a synopsis of each briefing prioritizing meetings, commenting on documents, and summarizing travel. This was more responsibility that was usually assigned to a GS-5 temporary hire. However, Ms. Baugh began her career as a secretary and understood the value of opportunities provided to her as an Army civilian at then Texcom. Mrs. Wright describes Ms. Baugh as a great mentor who empowered her test team to be productive members of an IPT that was crucial to shaping FBCB2. And Madeline, I said I was going to embarrass you, if you could please stand up for a second. Because I want to emphasize that it's not just in our memories and the Hall of Fame plaque that will hang that Myra Baugh's contributions will be remembered. It's in those that she took the time to lead and develop, like Madeline, now the Deputy Director of the Mission Command Test Director. Myra's contributions to operational testing are enduring, and they continue to enhance our mission today. We welcome her wholeheartedly as our 43rd member of our Operational Testers Hall of Fame. People first, Army strong, and truth in testing. Having been chosen by the Operational Testers Hall of Fame Board of Directors, <coughs> excuse me, be it known that Mrs. Myra Ball is hereby inducted into the Operational Testers Hall of Fame on this 29th day of October 2021 for her outstanding contributions to Army Operational Testing. Ms. Ball shall have her portrait and record of the excellence of her achievements placed on permanent display in the Operational Testers Hall of Fame, located in the headquarters building of the United States Army Operational Test Command, Fort Hood, Texas. Ms. Ball will receive a framed replica of the plaque to bear witness to her significant achievements in support of operational testing. The plaque is being escorted by Mr. Richard Lewandowski of the OTC G4.
Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Army Operational Test Command 2021 Operational Tester Hall of Fame inductee, Ms. Myra Ball. You know, it's interesting because uh, I've been told by several that I don't tell jokes very well. I don't have good timing. So I'm amazed that somebody actually talked about my sense of humor. <laughs> but I will have to tell you, one time I did actually dance on my desk many, many years ago. And I won't say when or where. Uh, but I want to thank, by the way, uh, everybody here, it's great to see everybody. Uh, I want to thank General Gardner and the OTC Command Group for the most prestigious, prestigious honor that I could ever imagine receiving at the end of my career. I especially want to thank Rich Lewandowski for his nomination and shepherding it through the selection process. I hope my contribution to the TNE mission assisted in making every soldier's mission successful. The OTC mission, along with the Army's mission and values, became my mission and values. It made me the person I am today. I also want to thank my family for their support over the years. And those with me today are my daughter, Medina, and my brother and sister-in-law, Tom and Sharon Carter. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge and thank my former department heads, supervisors, mentors, coworkers, as well as personal friends for supporting me. <clears throat> I can't mention all of you by name, but some of them are here today. They are Will Tam, Elita Castro, Al Stroud and his wife Donna, Mary Kuhlman, Dr. Rick Cass, along with his wife Cheryl, and Gail Shule, as well as Waylon and Bill Fessler, and others that I've worked with over the years. I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the personnel that supported me as a test officer and allowed me to be the best top officer I could be. You are only as good as your team. I'm proud to say that Madeline Wright, that General Gardner's already spoke of, was a member of my FBCB2 team and that she has risen to where she is today. There are also some members, and you saw them all come in later, of my Frisco Lakes Veterans Club family attending today. They drove all the way here from Frisco this morning. Thank you. They actually changed their original charter to allow me to join the club. The organization's model is always serving and provides cash donations and as well as support to multiple veterans organizations in the DFW. In fact, my organization, one of the members uh, at the uh, Homeless Veterans Center of Dallas, has established a welding program to teach homeless veterans uh, uh, a job so that they can actually go out and get employed and become members of society again. I first want to start by telling you that my motto, adopted early in life, was written by John Greenleaf Whittier. And it says, of all sad words, tongue or pen, the saddest are these it might have been. In plain English, if you don't try, you will never know. This phrase made me realize that challenges could become opportunities and motivated me during my lifetime. After being notified of this honor, I read another phrase that says, don't look back unless it's to see how far you've come. So if you will bear with me for just a little while, I'm going to do exactly that. My trip through life and career began early on as a military wife. My career, none of it planned, took twists and turns, and when I looked back, I realized how each job qualified me for the next one. My experiences will show, no matter who you are, that if you take a risk, along with hard work, due diligence, perseverance, gaining knowledge and leadership skills, building relations and with supportive leaders and mentors, you will never know what you might be or have done when you retire from your career. My first job was a travel agency in Joplin, Missouri. Two days after graduation, the manager took a risk and hired me due to a recommendation. Math shorthand and typing qualified me for me this, this position. I also worked at other travel agencies as we moved from assignment to assignment. 
When we were transferred to Germany, I couldn't speak German, so I began working at the Bach Kreuznach Elementary School as a volunteer teacher's aide. The teacher aide is experienced as well as posting government regulations and assisting customers as a travel agent qualified me for this position. I then became the secretary there, and this was when I became the teacher's aide, there was actually the Status of Forces Agreement that would not allow any American spouse to be hired in a, in a position supporting the military. And while I was there as a teacher's aide, the Status of Forces Agreement was changed, and I'd already been acting as a volunteer secretary at the time as well, so I got hired into the position, and that's how I began my career with the Civil Service. Our last military transfer was to Fort Hood, and I was hired by the Aetna Finance Company as a loan processor while I was trying to get back on civil service. Posting government regulations, developing airfares, assisting customers qualified me for this position. I was then hired as a civil service budget clerk with the director of logistics at DOL and main post, and working at the finance company qualified me for that position. As you can see, it's, it, you never know. After working at DOL as a budget analyst for seven years, I became a budget analyst at OTC, developing co long-range cost estimates for future equipment and West weapon systems qualified me for this position. My supervisors from my first job as a travel agent and the last job as I had a budget analyst at OTC were all women. Elita Castro was a supervisor in OTC budget who supported me for years. These women leaders who that I was fortunate to have throughout the first part of my career became my role models. Then I arrived in OTC in 1981, and there were always challenging and new experiences. I soon, soon learned that the items we budgeted for at DOL was exactly what OTC was testing. It was during my time as a budget analyst that the operational test and evaluation mission became my passion. In the beginning, working for and with combat-hardened men was very different because I've had all these women bosses before. And they had, many of them had just come out of Vietnam, and they hadn't been out of Vietnam very long. Then, uh, this is when I discovered that very few men had worked with a civil servant, much less a female civil servant. Many of them mistook the three budget analysts as secretaries until they learned we had signature authority for their operations and test money. <laughs> this is when I learned to be very direct, supported the test officers to the best of my ability, and received their respect. I also watched, listened, and learned from these men and gained their support. A military test officer asked, once asked me if I had been to CAS-Q. I said I had not. I had just learned from the very best over the years. During the time as a budget analyst, I was given many challenges, such as leading the process of documenting the workflow that General Gardner spoke about of test planning and the budgeting, from when a test was assigned to a director to when a report was submitted to headquarters. Another challenge was integrating several individual tests into an integrated outline test plan and still maintaining the integrity of their resources required for testing. These challenges always allowed me to be creative and provided solutions to support the testing mission. There were many leaders at OTC that encouraged and supported me. Reedy Stone, who the building that is next to the headquarters building is named after, recommended that I, as a budget analyst, attend the test officer's course and encourage me to join the International Test and Evaluation Association. And I said, Reedy, really, I'm just a budget analyst. And he said, doesn't matter. You need to go to the test officer's course. And so I went to the test officer's course, and it was very good. And then at the very end, the uh, trainer said, somebody asked the trainer, what about the money? And he said, oh, that's not a problem. We have lots of money. <laughs> and I stood up, and I said, excuse me? <laughs> and that's when I started working on the uh, outline test plan and TQM at that time. Uh, the workflow chart. Uh, and Art Woods and Alita Castro supported me in this effort. And Art Woods, your technology center is named after him. I worked for him many years as a budget analyst. 
And when I went to him one day and told him I wanted to be a test officer, and he looked at me, and I could tell he was very skeptical, but I told him what I wanted to do, and he supported me, and he took actions to assist me. And um, later acknowledged that he was proud of me. The first time when I briefed the command group and the general before we took the team to Kentucky for focus dispatch, he came up to me and he said, Myra Ball, when did you become a test officer? <laughs> My experience in OTC budget actually qualified me for this position. And as a civil service female test officer that had never been in the military, believe me, all eyes were on me, from the secretaries all the way to the commanding general. And this was the biggest challenge of my career. There are too many personnel over the years to even begin to name all those who supported me, but I'm going to name just a few as a test officer. Lieutenant Colonel Mo Mogi Lee actually selected me to be assigned to his directorate as a test officer in training. I think they then later drew straws and I was assigned to Dr. Cass, who was introduced here today, as assistant data manager for ATEX 1 and 2 tests. And these were the five uh, command and control systems at the time, the original five command and control systems at the time. And while being the assistant data manager, I was given the challenge of tracking daily each piece of data collection equipment, the data media, the military equipment it was installed in, as well as all test personnel, and this was a brigade sized test, by the way. I knew that our IT department had tracked our computer equipment with barcodes and discovered they had a very, very large supply of them because they had ordered barcodes for all of the, the outlying directors as well as here. So we used those, the test team developed a barcode reading software program and they procured readers, and everything had a barcode put on it, including the test personnel badges. And being a scanned every day was a big joke. Uh, everybody laughed about being scanned, and now look how far we've come. Everything is scanned. Not just you, but everything is scanned. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Lee then assigned me as operations officer for ATEX-3, and it was at his daily after action brief that I learned not to give the boss the bad news first. <laughs> I would come and I'd brief him and finally one day said, Myra, do you not know? You don't tell me the bad news first. So I learned very quickly about that. While a test officer, I received great support not only from Colonel Lee and Rick Cass, but also from Colonel Rick Sayer, who is the ACTI director, and Brigadier General A.J. Medora, OTC commander. I began being assigned to small tests such as the sick test and others. General Medora and Colonel Sayre then assigned me to lead the large experiments, focus dispatch, assigned me as a command group officer, operations officer during the execution of Task Force 21 experiment at Fort Irwin, and the FBCB2 test officer. During the FBCB2 test planning and early execution, I also had the support of Lieutenant Colonel Ed Weinberg as well as Lieutenant Colonel Weltham, G8HQDA, and a Welt is here today, who was also involved in FBCB2 planning and later became the director here of ACTID. After several years, I received another opportunity and accepted a position at Joint Forces Command in Norfolk. This was another new command that had been given the mission for conducting joint warfighting experimentation and looking at especially asymmetrical warfare. I was assigned as the Warfighting Experimentation Deputy Director. One of the challenges given to me was planning the formation of that entirely new department, as well as all the related processes and procedures. Colonel Hill, he was an Air Force Colonel. He, I was actually working on a big experiment team, and uh, the uh, Marine Colonel that I was working for at the time told me to go down to the corner and talk to the Air Force Colonel in his office. So I went down there and he said, I need your help. I've got to stand up this entire department and everybody's telling me you can do it. And I said, been there, done that. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to work on this big experiment. Well, he kept after me, so I finally gave in and I did it. He said, 
When we're finished, you can, I, I will give you, a, I'll send you to a really good job. You get to pick what you want to do. I said, okay. Three years later, he said it thought it would be six months. Three years later, he left. <laughs> but he did, but he did put me in the job that I asked for. I'll have to tell him that. And then later I was assigned as the lead of the, for the planning and formation of the space application experimentation cell, which was actually a SecDef directive. And now we have Spacecom. I mean, I wish I was working now. I'd love to go and work for Spacecom. I mean, they're a new organization. Here we go again with some more challenges, you know. I just wish it had happened earlier. While at JFCOM meeting at the Pentagon, I was told about an opportunity to support the DAG-357 test and evaluation mission, which of course included OTC mission. After comparing the pros and cons of retiring from civil service, I gave JFCOM two weeks notice and retired. While at G357, I got a chance once again to work with then Colonel Ham. Uh, there he was in the office, so you never know when they're going to turn up. I was able to support OTC with procuring their test resources as well as developing an Army General Order signed by the Army Chief of Staff that gave OTC the big role to support the network integration evaluation test events down at Fort Bliss. It felt right about being back with the Army and continuing to support the test and evaluation mission. In closing, I appreciate this great honor today from my peers and it has brought me back to where I felt like I always belonged, the OTC family. And as I say, there's no place like home. <laughs>